me to start with the totem pole in Pioneer Square, which is the first piece of Native American art, and in fact, the first piece of any art placed in a Seattle public space when it was stalled in 1898. But that's not the best place to start. The best place to start is in 1897, when the steamship Portland arrived in Seattle from Alaska, carrying 68 miners and about two tons of gold from the Klondike in Canada's Yukon Territory. And where the gold had been discovered spread like wildfire and the Klondike gold rush was on. And as with all gold rushes, thousands of people went there to get rich and Seattle was a principal place to start the journey. And before departing prospectors needed to acquire supplies, they came to Seattle to get them. And Seattle businesses sprang up and rapidly grew to fill that need. <clears throat> and when prospectors returned, they spent much of their gold here. And many who came, whether they were new, newly rich or newly broke, they stayed and helped Seattle grow and prosper. Business leaders and politicians quickly recognized the marketing value of calling Seattle the gateway to the north, to the riches of Alaska and the Yukon. In 1898, a group of men who belonged to the Seattle Chamber of Commerce were on a cruise to Alaska for both pleasure and to promote the, uh, business with that territory. And they happened upon a village on Tongass Island in southeastern Alaska, and they saw an impressive 50-foot tall totem pole near the beach. They concluded that it would be a fine souvenir to bring home and erect as a symbol of Seattle, the gateway to the north. The pole had been created long before to honor the chief of all women, a Klingit chief who was drowned in the Nass River during a trip to a sister, ailing sister. And the Seattleites knew nothing about that and little, if anything, about native people of the Northwest coast. And, and it's a good bet that they didn't care. They cut down the pole, they cut it in half, floated it out to their vessel and hoisted it aboard and left. After it arrived in Seattle, the pole was assembled in place where it remains today. It is reportedly one of the few poles in a public uh, setting that's carved by native craftsmen to honor a deceased relative and illustrate myths and events of a specific lineage. The Seattleites allege that the village was deserted, so their taking was legitimate. The vessel's third mate did recall that there was an old man present, but he said that he stayed in his house and looked scared to death, and one can only imagine. In fact, all able-bodied men were out fishing, and the women were away working in the canneries, which processed the fish and for shipment south. Only the elderly and small children remained. The donors were eventually fined for their theft, but the stolen property was never returned and $500 was reportedly paid as a settlement to the tribe and Seattle's totem pole became a, a city landmark. In 1938, that pole was damaged by an arsonist and the fire damage plus extensive dry rot necessitated its removal. And the original pole was replaced under a federal program up in Alaska focused on the restoration of native poles and it was replaced with this 1940 replica, which is still there. The replica was carved near Ketchikan, Alaska, primarily by Klingit carvers who were closely related to the lineage to which the original pole belonged. And the original pole that was stolen was shipped to Alaska to be used by those restorers, and afterwards it was allowed to decay in its homeland among the Klingit. During the process of removing the pole from its native village, the beak of the raven at the head of Nass, which is this figure you're seeing here with the big beak, he's a major figure in the myth depicted in the pole, that beak was broken and it was replaced with a straight beak. The native carvers involved in replicating the original refused to carve the, that new straight beak because it was the straight beak of a raven. And they knew that the original would have a curved beak like a hawk, as you see here. And it turned out that that was consistent with earlier photos of the original pole. This is particularly interesting because their knowledge countered the belief among non-natives at the time that contemporary natives in 1940, whose people had endured years of efforts by white people to eradicate their cultures, that those contemporary natives lacked knowledge about the 19th century poles or the details of the crest on them. And that wasn't the fact at all. One member of the Chamber of Commerce group was a Seattleite Seattle named Reverend J.P.D. Lloyd, who was the rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church and an active and admired member of the community and considered quite an intellectual. 
He was also a member of the Public Library Board and the founder of the University Club, which still exists on uh, Madison and Bourne and down on the edge of downtown Seattle. In 1909, the Reverend Lloyd discussed the poll's history and meaning in a monograph entitled The Message of an Indian Relic. And I think it's the first scholarly work written about the poll and typical of the time and for writings about native art in subsequent decades, Lloyd describes the poll from the standpoint of one whose focus has always been on the arts of Europe and ancient Greece and Rome. He describes the native art as primitive, and frankly, that's a category in which it remained in Western studies for many decades to come. I think it was true when I was in college. And he opines that the sculptures are carved in crude and often grotesque yet artistic fashion. That being said, Lloyd does provide a great deal of information about the pole and the images depicted, but he was a man of his time and he refers to the creators as heathens who had to be subjugated by Christian missionaries. Lloyd concludes that although the stories depicted on poles may appear absurd and ridiculous to our more cultivated minds, our estimates of their value shouldn't be governed uh, by the standards of a more enlightened era, but by the mental stature and development of a much less advanced way of thinking about nature and man. Here, he concludes, we discern buds of art and language, which among us have come to full blossom. When the installation of Seattle's pole began a decades long period in which the art of the Northwest Coast natives became iconic symbols of our city. And it's an odd situation because totem poles and the carvings we associate with them are not forms used by the natives anywhere near Seattle. The native people who lived throughout the Puget Sound region of the Coast Salish, whose tribes never created totem poles and whose carving style was nothing like that of the native groups of the North. So what are totem poles? Briefly, they are monumental carvings consisting of poles, posts, or pillars carved with figures representing myths and legends of the native people. Such carvings are generally associated with the Klingon of southeastern Alaska, the Haida of the Queen Charlotte Islands, and the Simshian and Kwakwakawak of western British Columbia. Kwakwakawak are used to be called Kwakutl, but it's, that was the incorrect name. Uh, the raising and dedication of a totem pole was always an elaborate affair worthy of a potlatch of gifts and feasting. And a potlatch was a major element of the socioeconomic system of many Northwest coastal tribes. And it focused on the reaffirmation of family, clan, and international connections, and the human connection with the supernatural world. It might also include legal proceedings such as namings, business negotiations, adoptions, deaths, transfers of physical and especially intellectual property, adoptions, treaty proceedings, and a number of other things. The potlatch also served as a strict resource management regime where coastal peoples discussed, negotiated, and affirmed rights to and uses of specific territories and resources. The success of the potlatch demanded and encouraged dramatic and artistic talents from composers, singers, actors, drummers, dancers, as well as a stage director. And the hosts offered food and secured their reputations by the extravagance of their gifts, gifts to those attending. Guests invited to the potlatch dug the hole and set the totem pole in place while their host explained the figures on the pole most of which illustrated tales of past tribal events. The legends, many of which were based on stories and myths considered the property of the clan giving the potlatch, were dramatized in songs and dances and the performers wore costumes and carved masks. A very sacred mask among the Kwakwakawak was the Hamatsa mask shown here. Traditionally, the design of the totem pole was inspired by and referred symbolically to the incidents described in the mythology and legendary history of the people. Some of the tales are the special property of a group of people who consider themselves descended from the common clan ancestor. And these stories relate experiences and adventures of members of that group. And stories are best known by those to whom they belong since they were never fully told to outsiders. When Christian missionaries established themselves in native territories, they quickly concluded that the potlatch was a heathen celebration. They discouraged totem pole carving and destroyed many poles and native cultural artifacts. White owners of fishing and timber enterprises opposed potlatches because they took workers away from their businesses. 
Banning them outright was deemed appropriate, and from 1885 to 1951, potlatches in Canada were outlawed. This resulted in the destruction of a great many artifacts and nearly ended the carving of poles and masts. By the end of the 19th century, the precise, elegant form line that characterized northern northwest coast art had been gradually replaced by less complex paintings and carvings, some made for ceremonial use, but much of it created for the souvenir market. In the early part of the 20th century, Seattleites assimilated native culture as their own and incorporated what they thought was native symbolism, which was real or newly created by them, in a number of practices and events. They weren't knowledgeable about native culture and traditions, but they pretended to be. And it's really, it's kind of similar to the approach by non-natives to Pacific Island cultures with patrons in tiki bars and dancing the hula, pretending that they knew the culture. In 1909, Seattle's first World's Fair, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, was held on the University of Washington campus, and over 3,700,000 people attended it for the four-month run, and all were exposed to images of Northwest Coast Native art as symbols of our growing and prosperous city. At the South Gate, they saw a modified Tori Gate, the iconic Japanese structure that marks the boundary between the sacred and mundane. In this case, the vertical posts were totem pole designs with light bulbs in the eyes of the figures, and structures with similar characteristics were seen elsewhere on the grounds. An exciting and frequently visited place north of the expo grounds, just a short train ride away, was the privately owned Ravenna Park, home of a number of old growth trees, which they were uh, tourist attractions to, by themselves because there were so few left, but also installed on the forest for expo visitors to enjoy was a teepee, not used by natives in this region, an Indian canoe and five totem poles, all made for sale and crudely carved by local carvers. They were supplied by John Stanley, owner of Yule Curiosity Shop on Seattle's waterfront. And we'll hear about him a little bit later. No doubt those visitors and Seattleites for years to come assumed that such images were legitimate representations of indigenous cultures rather than products created for and sometimes by white people for commercial purposes. There was little concern about authenticity. Business was business and the white men of Seattle proceeded accordingly. A good example of that attitude was the creation of the Potlatch Celebration, a precursor to today's Seafair, which was held each year from 1911 to 1914. It was named after the native Potlatch, but the native symbols in the celebration were all bastardizations of native culture created by white men. And the men you see are all white men. Similarly, when Seattle erected James Wen's bronze statue of, of Chief Seattle in 1912, native images were present, but they were all white men dressed up in a manner they thought appropriate, kind of like Halloween. It's worth noting, noting that at that time and well into my young adulthood, Wen was referred to as Seattle's first sculptor. Now he's more correctly referred to as Seattle's first non-native sculptor. When visiting Seattle, in the early 20th century, one place to see and touch the mysterious and primitive images of Western natives was the old curiosity shop. A now venerable institution that John Stanley founded in 1899. In its early days, Stanley exhibited and offered for sale Northwest native art that had been created for use by natives, mass used in dances, carvings used in ceremonies or created as important symbols and totem poles to commemorate events or people. A number of those are reportedly present in museum and private collections, both here and in Europe. But Stanley also paid natives to create supposedly authentic works for sale to tourists that were quickly and awfully poorly carved. For example, here is a 19th century carving of Sisutl, a double-headed supernatural creature that is typically portrayed as a serpent with a threatening protruding tongue and a humanoid face at its center. Sisutl is a prominent crest and mythological creature common to the Kwakwakawak and other Northwest Coast indigenous people. Here's another example of Sisutl among a group of ceremonial carvings that was surrendered to the Canadian government in 1921 during the potlatch ban. In comparison, here is a depiction of Sisutl with a thunderbird standing on it that was acquired from Yule Curiosity Shop. 
And it's one of at least two identical pieces. And the carving is very in very low relief. And it took comparatively little time to create. And it was carved sometime in the 1940s. The person who bought it, no doubt, considered it a fine artwork with a reputable provenance. He named it Wings Over the World and gave it to the University of Washington. And it's displayed in the lobby of Guggenheim Hall, home of the university's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Now, having set low standards, the Stanley legacy probably helped foster the idea that this primitive art form was easy to create. Many non-native carvers with no trained training uh, created totem poles for their front yards or sold them to others. And many of us who've been in Seattle for a long time remember poorly carved, sometimes homemade totem poles in local gardens. In 1939, Stanley offered to the city of Seattle a totem pole that he'd had made for sale for placement in West Seattle's Belvedere Park. Ironically, the park looks over the mouth of the Duwamish River, an important area once occupied by the Duwamish people. And that pole had interesting figures, but they weren't carved for any purpose other than for resale, and they represented no story or legend. It was considered native, and it was another good example of Seattle, so it stood there for many years until rot necessitated its removal. What to do? Well, two white Boeing engineers volunteered to carve a replica, which you see here, and their creation was placed there in 1966. After the potlatch ban was repealed in 1951, there was a slow resurgence of native carving and a revival of interest among Native Americans in their heritage. The 1960s and 70s are known as a modern renaissance of the traditional forms of Northwest Coast Native art. That characterization is criticized by many Natives, especially younger ones, because it's a period during which some white artists and scholars are given credit for bringing back native art. While in reality, many of the senior and natives were still teaching their children as much as they could. Many elders had been teaching and keeping the forms alive. And those who uh, tried to keep the culture alive during difficult times uh, were, were, were working hard, but uh, the generation that lived through the bands applaud a number of white artists for their efforts. Two in particular are Bill Holm and Dwayne Pasco, both skilled carvers knowledgeable about native cultures and promoters of cultural understanding. And they have a number of carved works displayed in Seattle's public spaces. Their works use the traditional forms of the 19th century, which is typical of works created by most of their generation. And as we will see, many younger native artists today often begin with traditional forms or otherwise refer to cultural history, but take a more contemporary approach. At the top of the list of those artist scholars is Bill Holm. When he died in 2020, Holm was professor emeritus of art history and curator emeritus of Northwest Indian or Coast Indian art at the Burke Museum and is recognized internationally as one of the most knowledgeable experts in the field of Northwest Coast native art history. Throughout his tenure at the UW, Holm was known for his open door policy at the Burke, freely allowing, allowing natives to see, touch, and study the pieces in the museum collection. As you can imagine, most museums in the, in the country and the world wouldn't allow uh, private people to come in and touch, but Holmes recognized that this was part of the native culture and ought to be shared. Many well-known native artists were inspired and trained by Holm, and he maintained a stellar reputation among regional tribes. His 1965 book, Northwest Coast Indian Art, An Analysis of Form, published by the University of Washington Press, is con considered <coughs> excuse me, the standard introductory text in the field. And it's now in its 18th printing and has sold over 100,000 copies, which is a phenomenal number for a university press. Holmes and his books, book are credited with inspiring a remarkable number of artists engaged in creating Northwest Coast and native art. Except for a few cases in his younger years, Holmes, who created quite a number of, uh, of carvings, didn't sell his works. He created finely carved replicas of pieces either in the museum or long gone in order to bring them before the public, and he called his works artifacts. On the eastern edge of the Burke Museum parking lot are two of Holmes' artifacts, which have been described as superb representations of two different cultural styles. On the left is the Shimshian pole created as a memorial to a deceased chief, 
and the taller Haida pole on the right is a replica of a frontal pole of a chief's house. This is Holmes' replica of a late 19th century Haida carving of a killer whale created as a grave memorial, and only the original fin is in the Burke collection. But Holmes created the, uh, the hole for all to see, and it stood at the entrance of the recently demolished museum building, and it and another highly regarded replica by Holm are no longer displayed outside. I'm betting that Holm would appreciate the fact that the newest native work outside of the new Burke doesn't represent traditional work from the north, but instead gives a contemporary focus on the Chinook, a tribe living near the mouth of the Columbia River on the southwest coast of Washington and the northwest coast of Oregon. This is a 2020 work called Guests from the Great River, and it consists of 11 larger-than-life bronze paddles by artist Tony Johnson, who's also chairman of the Chinook Indian Nation, and Adam McIsaac. The paddles are carved in a variety of Chinook styles and sizes, which Chinook art is, I would say, pretty much unknown to a lot of people in the Northwest. And some of these are this, the uh, styles are hundreds of years old, and they're still made and used by communities today. And you note the notch at the top of each, that's distinct to the Columbia River and was used to grab hold of cottonwood roots along the riverbanks. Guests from the Great River is installed in the shape of a canoe, and it represents the cultural protocol of visiting canoes landing on a village on village shores. Different stories and figures are portrayed in each paddle and all are lifted in a traditional form of peaceful greeting. Johnson hopes they inspire that moment of greeting and respect when canoe families raise their paddles as they land on neighbors' beaches. Johnson explains that people who live here on this land without any knowledge of this information are really missing a big part of what makes this place itself. My interest in sharing these stories and teachings is that people will treat the place differently these Aboriginal lands of ours and the Aboriginal lands of our neighbors, if people were to really understand these stories. Another new contemporary sculpture greets visitors who enter the uh, Burke Museum South Lobby. This is the Weaver's Welcome, a unique collaboration between the museum and noted glass artist Preston Singletary, who's Klingit, Brian Perry and Anthony Jones Sr., both Port Gamble Scalum, or Scalalum, and David Franklin, a non-native who spent many years working with Duane Pascoe. This 10 and a half foot tall glass and bronze sculpture combines Salish motifs with imagery found in historical objects in the Burke's collection. The artists were allowed to kind of roam through the collection as Mr. Holm used to allow. And they looked at baskets and carved wooden objects. The face was inspired by Salish and Macaw facial sculpture and wears a typical Salish woven hat decorated with a common pattern in local native weaving. The relief work on the corona reflects a Northern Salish sea design style commonly found on spindle whorls used on the Southern coast of British Columbia. A spindle whorls are handheld pieces with kind of fly-like discs traditionally used by natives to spin wool into yarn. The triangles that run down the sides are in the design of communities from the Southern Salish Sea down to the Columbia River. And the sculpture's base was inspired by a small Quinault bentwood box in the Burke's permanent collection. And the patterns of beaded inlays on its side are those of the Quinault box and they represent the moon over water and sun over the mountains. The other major non-native Acting dur active during the so-called Renaissance who helped educate the next generation of native carvers about form line style is Dwayne Pascoe. Now 89, he began exhibiting his work for sale in the early 1960s and describes his work as indigenous style, a term that I presume he uses to set it apart from as designs of his own creation rather than copying those of generations before. Uh, it's interesting, uh, he speaks Chinook garden, <laughs> Chinook jargon, and has been long respected by native communities. Pasco has a number of works in Seattle's public spaces, including these three in Occidental Park. In the left-hand photo, we see Sun and Raven, and then Man Riding on Tail of Whale. Uh, Sun and Raven was carved for the 1974 World's Fair in Spokane and refers in part to the Indian legend about clever raven bringing light to the world by stealing the sun and moon. 
At the pole's base, the sun is held above the box in which it was stored before Raven stole it. And at the top, Raven holds the moon. The figure in the right photo is Sanakwa, a mythical giant of the deep forest. And she's usually shown as she's shown here with lips pursed and to utter a cry. In some stories, her cry could bring supernatural power, good luck, or great wealth. In others, she's a terrifying figure threatening to eat children and often referred to by parents to frighten children into obedience. In some versions of the Sanakwa myth, she's called the nightmare bringer. These works are good examples of Pasco's exceptional carving skills, but the fact that he sells his work is criticized today by some natives and, and native artists and commentators who argue that earning money from native style carving should be limited to those who are really direct cultural heirs to a particular tradition. Pasco has responded that he's an artist who needs no papers to prove who I am, what I am, or what I do, though he does say in 1985 he stopped making Hamatska mask uh, because the characters they represent are the prerogatives of members of the Kwakwakawa people, and he didn't feel comfortable creating them for sale. Works by Dwayne Pasco are still highly collectible and expensive, and early in his career, he created a number of works commissioned by government agencies, such as this well-regarded bicentennial totem pole carved in 1976 for the Sitka National Historical Park in Alaska. Nowadays, because of a well-founded sensitivity to cultural appropriation, these such commissions wouldn't, wouldn't be given to a non-native artist. A native artist well represented in regional public spaces is Marvin Oliver, who died in 2019 at the age of 73. He was an emeritus professor at the University of Washington who had a long career creating and teaching about native art. When he was a young man interested in native art, his father suggested that he go visit Bill Holm at the Burke. And he did, and he soon joined that large group of artists influenced by Holm. Oliver is a good example of native artists of an older generation who created contemporary art inspired by native traditions. And this has become the new norm with the current generation. Oliver used his Quinault and Isleta Pueblo heritage as an influence for his art, but he also took inspiration from Coast Salish traditions. Early on, he created traditional designs such as these. These are painted on cedar at the Broadview Public Library up in Greenwood in Northwest Seattle. On the right is Eagle, and on the left is an abstract rendition of Northwest Coast native forms. In 1996, Marvin Oliver sculpted Spirit of Our Youth, which is a good example of his incorporation of native motifs in a contemporary work. This 26 foot high cast bronze sculpture is in the shape of an orca dorsal fin and rising from the waves and that's rising from the waves and below are spawning salmon representing the cyclical nature and endurance of life. And above are abstract thunderbirds representing hope and prosperity. Oliver's themes were intended to inspire and Spirit of Our Youth was made for King County's Youth Services Center campus in the central area and plans are to relocate it in front of the county's new Children and Family Justice Center. In 2010, Oliver created a Salish Welcome, a 16 foot high sculpture of cast bronze, aluminum and glass, which looks out over the water just west of the government locks. Uh, most people don't see this. It's just beyond what used to be Hiram's restaurant. And it's worthy of a stop. And, and, and you can not only enjoy the sculpture, but right behind it is an outlook that looks out over the water. This is a modern depiction of a traditional Salish welcoming figure, which would have been placed on the beach in front of a village to welcome visitors. In this case, the figure welcomes both human visitors and the indispensable salmon as they come to the shallows below. He wears a conical cedar bark hat and a woven ceremonial robe and holds aloft a four foot diameter disc with a design that refers to the salmon life cycle with a male and a female salmon circling around a cluster of four glass salmon eggs. A Salish welcome is typical of what we're seeing today, not art bound by traditional forms, but contemporary visions that have been inspired by culture and history. The inclusion of Salish forms and references has begun to appear more often in recent years, and we'll be seeing much more of it. When people my age were growing up, Salish art was virtually unknown by non-native Seattleites. Anthropolo 
anthropologist Michael Q once noted that Central Coast Salish art was probably less abundant than art among uh, Northwest Coast tribes, for it was closely associated with private religious expression and used less in secular display. Whatever the reasons, it was rarely seen and was considered by most non-natives to be more archaic or pictographic than the more aesthetically advanced and marketable art from the North. A fitting change in the world of Seattle totem poles came about when the pole at Belvedere Park deteriorated. <clears throat> you will recall that it was a replacement of an original pole donated by John Stanley for that site. The city concluded that it was no longer appropriate for the site and not worthy of repairing. It was removed and renovated and given a less garish paint job and now stands in front of the Log House Museum, the headquarters of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. Many in West Seattle think the relocation of this iconic West Seattle symbol uh, to the museum is most appropriate. And in the, in, in, in the past, its placement would have really raised no questions. In the current age of a more cultural awareness and sensitivity, many argue that it is neither cultural nor historical, historically significant. And if the pole must remain in the public eye, it should be in a less important venue and used as an example of a time when non-native Seattleites had little knowledge or concern about native culture. The poll's removal gave the city an opportunity to do something unique. They commissioned this Salish story poll carved by Michael Halliday, a fifth generation descendant of the Duwamish chief Sealth for whom the city was named. Story poles were often used by the Coast Salish as support posts and longhouses and often focused on family history rather than the miss myths um, portrayed on poles from the north. Out of these pole tells the story of Duwamish people welcoming the Denny party and includes the stern of the schooner exact, which in which they arrived, and that's down in the bottom third of the pole. You can see the stern sticking out. Note the lower relief of the faces and their unibrow, and these are all forms commonly seen in Salish art. The pole is topped with a thunderbird honoring sea elf, whose noble status was reportedly affirmed by his reception of Thunderbird power from an important supernatural wealth giver during a vision quest held during his youth. Sea Elf's people believed he could call thunder from the skies, and they said that when he was angry, his voice thundered. And a white contemporary described him as a square-shouldered, deep-chested, stockily-built Indian with a voice like a trumpet. I always liked that description. Michael Halliday's next major work for a Seattle public space is going to be a large carved uh, Salish welcoming figure. It's scheduled to be installed next year in the main terminal at the King County International Airport at Boeing Field. Tacoma recently faced a set of circumstances similar to West Seattle's with an inauthentic totem pole. In 1903, it installed its own pole, hailed as the tallest one in the world, just in time for a visit by President Theodore Roosevelt. The pole was commissioned by two Tacoma businessmen and was allegedly carved by Alaska or British Columbian tribal members. And it was ultimately listed on the register of Tacoma historical places. In the mid seventies, it was taken down <coughs> and reinstalled after extensive restoration work. And about 40 years later, the pole had again deteriorated and the question was whether it should be repaired. Analysis by art historians and members of Klingit and Haida tribal representatives cast doubt on the claim that it had native origins. Some reported that it had been carved by anonymous artists in a lumber yard on Vashon Island. And they noted that it not only was uh, not carved in the Coast Salish style, it also misrepresented Haida Klinga people and art forms. Had these allegations been raised publicly in the 1970s, I doubt that they would have been given much credence. Uh, the facts that the pool was iconic and old was enough for non-native residents, despite how offensive it might be to local tribes. Concern and objections uh, voiced by the Puyallup, uh, Klingit, and Haida tribal members were finally recognized, and in 2021, the pool was cut apart and placed in storage. It was also removed from the historical register, and there's talk about putting a Salish work in its place, but I don't know what, what the status of that is, but that, that's being discussed. <clears throat> Getting back to Chief Seolf, sometime in his 60s, he was converted to Christianity and was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was given the name Noah. That's why sometimes you'll see the name Noah Seolf. 
The chief died in 1866 and was buried in Suquamish with an appropriate Christian tombstone that you see here. But what of his native heritage? In 2011, the Suquamish tribe corrected that defect by commissioning these two story poles by Andrea Wilbur Saigo, a member of the Squaxin Island and Skokomish tribes. Uh, the depictions here include Chief Seattle as a boy standing in front of sails, a reference to his alleged sighting at about the age of six of the arrival of Captain George Vancouver's ships on Puget Sound in 1792. And also we see Seattle as a warrior refer uh, referencing his skills as a tactician who headed off raids by other Indian groups. And we also see the chief as an older statesman giving a speech in 1855, a translation of which has become famous over the years. Saigo Wilbur is becoming a prominent contributor to, see, to art in Seattle's public spaces. She's been creating art for over 20 years and early on in her career, she was criticized by dealers for not providing the more marketable art in the Northwest Alaskan native style and her determination to stay with the Coast Salish style is paid off in the end. You can see Wilbur Saigo's two welcoming figures at Intellectual House on the UW campus. It's a longhouse style facility that provides multi-service learning and a gathering space for Native American students, faculty and staff, as well as others from various cultures and communities to come together in a welcoming environment to share knowledge. The carved cedar panels of a man and a woman, each with their arms outstretched and hands palm up in the traditional sign of welcome and protection, uh, were commissioned for the building. Uh, they represent traditional house posts, which she references by the half discs at the top of each piece. And these panels show the incised low relief carving that is typical of Coast Salish uh, work. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, two upcoming installations of Wilbur Saigo works. Uh, she's creating a 21 foot tall carving called Grandmother Frog, which will be installed soon to watch over Chief Seattle Club's new affordable housing development in Pioneer Square. Her sculpture will be the first Salish carving on display in a downtown public space. And it refers to, to Skokomish stories about Grandmother Frog, who's the creator's wife and represents the connection between the land and the sky worlds. And she, uh, she will be keeping watch over the intersection of Second and Yesler, where the Coast Salish tribes once had a longhouse village called Little Crossing Over Place. And that was in an area that was regraded uh, by Seattle's early residents to create the first downtown. Wilbur Saigo was also creating two pieces for the Washington State Convention Center, as well as a commission for the Seattle Kraken Hockey Facility. And speaking of sports facilities, when CenturyLink Field was constructed in 2002, Susan Point, a master of Coast Salish native art, was commissioned to create two sets of works that are collectively called Written into the Earth. These cast bas relief sculptures placed in an arc at the bottom of the main stairway represent world cultures and each is a low relief face in the Coast Salish style. Point also designed the cast iron tree grates that you see on the right uh, and they're throughout the stadium and the exhibition grounds. And their designs are related to those of native spindle whirls, which I mentioned. And Point often uses those in her works. And as can be seen here, she embellishes them with incised designs. Susan Point's sculptural works at the West Seattle pump station incorporate her contemporary approaches to Coast Salish design and designs on the facility gates to the right and on the walls next to them and on the side of the building between those gates. Her designs refer to the integration of people and their natural environment, important symbolism in this wastewater treatment facility. The cast concrete tiles seen on the left cover the building's front wall and comprise the work Water, the Essence of Life. Coast, Coast Salish style faces are the central focus and they're surrounded by swirling water with salmon and seabirds. The circle of life and new beginning are represented by salmon and bird eggs within the adult subjects. This organic theme is also represented on the walls next to the facility gates. <clears throat> and to the right, getting in more detail, is man and thunderbirds. And this is a split 64 inch diameter stainless steel disc with cut out symmetrical designs of a human figure, mouth agape, surrounded by mythical thunderbirds. There's another work that most people don't know about, but it's out there. This is uh, the Thomas Street Pedestrian Bridge. 
and it's four blocks west of the Seattle Center. It's called Snow Call Moon, the Transformer uh, by Roger Fernandez, created in 2012. Fernandez is a member of the Lower Elwha Scallum tribe based near Port Angeles and describes himself as an artist and a storyteller. And this piece is full of imagery related to uh, native culture. The principal story is from the Snoqualmie Indians known as people of the moon, Snoqual, who lived in the Snoqualmie Valley in East King and Snohomish counties. Uh, the structure represents a longhouse and the Snoqualmie are moon, the son of the earth mother and a star father, who is the main character of the creation myth referred to in this sculpture. He was kidnapped and raised by the dog salmon people, but was able to return to his own people as a young man. And as he was returning, he traveled down the mountain by following rivers to the ocean. And throughout his travels, he transformed the world to prepare it for habitation uh, of people to come. The interior side of the panel closest to the street shows Snowquall making the salmon people and putting them in the river. In the opposite panel, visible here on the right, we see him making plants, deer, and mountains. On the back of that panel, he painted traditional native basket designs. And the bronze waveforms in the sidewalk that you see here refer to a basket design that represents salmon swimming in a river. The street, street side panel shows Pacific Northwest mountains <coughs> rendered as red triangles at the bottom. And the wandering blue path of the Duwamish River a fruitful resource until white people modified it to its present course, which is shown with a jagged black line. This is a reference to the second story of transformation that Fernandez depicts. Unlike the native peoples who lived harmoniously with the earth, subsequent inhabitants sought to control and improve nature. With the circle and cross, he refers to the fact that native cultures use the circle to symbolize the cycle of life and return to completeness, completeness while the intersecting lines of the cross symbolize power. On the connecting lintel is the face of Snowquall, rendered in metal and glass, industrial materials that Western society deem more superior than wood and other natural materials. Two good examples of the continuing direction towards more contemporary styles are Salish welcoming figures by Sean Peterson. He's of Puyallup and Tulalip, tribal ancestors, ancestry, and you will often see Qualsius included with his name. That is his native name, something you would never have uh, seen outside of tribal uses until relatively recently, as younger natives publicly proclaim their heritage. The same is true of, of listing one's tribal ancestry, which I've done in this paper. Such proclamations would have been criticized by non-natives, the vast majority of whom were not exposed to and had a little interest in tribal connections. This is Peterson's welcome figure in downtown Tacoma, which is his modern take on a traditional Puyallup form. Peterson says that the earth red color here signifies the healing power associated with Thunderbird by the Puyallup people long ago, and the print and the painted dress pattern convey a healing that is called upon after the devastation of losing a prominent village. Contrary to surrounding tribes who envision the Thunderbird as a massive creature who consumes whales, the Puyallup perceived the being to be no larger than a small hawk. It is, he explains, an indication that power was not associated with mass and that the strength to heal was of equal, if not greater importance in the philosophy of our ancestors. When the Seattle waterfront renovation is complete, it will include a number of commissioned artworks, including these uh, welcoming figures by Sean Peterson, Qualsius. They will be bronze and red cedar figures looking out over Puget Sound and each their uh, different heights. Two will be approximately 15 feet and a third will be just over 14 feet. Peterson says that although they may be reminiscent of the welcoming figures, native villages often placed on the beach to greet visitors, which we've heard about with other works I've shown you, his will represent the human family, not members of any one group or tribe. And they stand as symbols of unity and peace. Included on the figures and their concrete bases will be incised designs inspired by those used in Coast Salish carving, painting, and weaving. Peterson reports that in initial discussions about what should be created, it was suggested that a totem pole would be an appropriate form for the waterfront. Uh, I don't know if they were speaking of a pole with Salish designs or a Northwest Coast style pole, but reason prevailed and we'll have something unique. 
as his sculptures will stand at the, at the edge of a modern technological city with many international visitors, Peterson elected to combine, combine contemporary forms with designs of the indigenous people of Puget Sound. And these welcoming figures may be too contemporary for some, but native art is progressing as art and culture often do. And I think they'll be well received in the long run. The old forms appear in different ways and as with the increasing number of other Coast Salish works in our public spaces, they remind us that we are in land once occupied by indigenous people. So now you've seen a glimpse of native art in Seattle's public spaces. And I'm happy to report that if I had more time, I could show you a lot more. And you might be asking what's next? Well, it's a safe bet that we'll not see Northwest Coast totems installed in any public spaces. Northwest Coast art is uh, still much admired and highly collectible, but it raises uncomfortable and difficult issues. And frankly, I, I think we have enough of it. Northwest Coast art has had its day in Seattle's public spaces. It's also a safe prediction that native art in public spaces will be created by natives. Tribes have now asserted themselves and have enough influence to protect their cultural interests. On the national level, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990 makes it illegal to offer or display for sale or sell any art or craft product in a matter that falsely suggests it is Indian produced or Indian product or the product of a particular Indian or Indian tribe or Indian arts and crafts organization. You may recall just recently that a local dealer got in some trouble because he took an artist at the artist's word that the artist was native and that was not the case. And so the dealer got in trouble under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. Many tribal members would rather prohibit the sale of their art forms by anyone other than non-natives who have no link to native culture and traditions. Uh, they, they really can't do that, but at least the public is put on notice when they're considering the purchase of a work by one who's not genetically linked to the native forms uh, uh, depicted. It's an understatement to say that the history of indigenous arts throughout the country and throughout the world is tumultuous and disrespectful and painful. Knowledge and sensitivity to the foreign and unknown are difficult things to install in the masses, but it, it, can, it can be said that in the relatively recent past, I think we've made some pretty good progress and we're out on a positive course. And with that, I've come to a very good place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. That was utterly fascinating. Um, I'm gonna just take a quick look here at the comments. And there, there are a couple of comments that were made, and I think some questions got answered during the, the course of your, um, your presentation. But one question from uh, Susan Boyle, uh, guests from the Great River, where is that exhibited? Oh, Steve Russell, I think answered it, outside the new Burke, is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. It's right, as you go in the parking lot of the Burke, it's, it uh, is, is right next to the building. Well, we're seeing. And then let's see here. So another question here from Susan, how influential was the old curiosity shop in encouraging collection of native art? Uh, I think when it was alone, I think it was probably, it was really the only place around. And uh, I think it was influential. And as I said, I think it was influential in having people uh, interested in collecting, but not being given uh, works that are really representational of uh, good native works, except in the early days. Uh, so that, that, that was the real problem. But I as I said, I think it had an influence because a lot of people thought that was quality art and it really wasn't. So Ann Jenner, um in addition to many others who are thanking you for a really informative talk, um, also asks, how do you do your research? And other than site visits and archival research, do you also interview artists or uh, speak with different tribal representatives? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, for my books, I mean, the latest, the book that was most recently published, I interviewed 90 different artists, either on the phone or via email, uh, Marvin Oliver being one of them, and Sean Peterson. Uh, 
so my research always includes that because I want to hear what the artist has to say about the work, why they did it, what they had in mind. Uh, none of my works are critical of the artworks. They really report, uh, you know, what, what they are. <clears throat> and then in this case, uh, frankly, uh, you know, I'm pretty knowledgeable, but I'm also an old white guy. And so it's kind of important to get some native input. So Marvin Oliver's son reviewed the paper. And I've also asked uh, Sean Peterson and, and uh, Preston Singletary to look at it. They haven't gotten back to me yet, but Sean was very helpful. He's also a very good editor. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, that, that in, you know, in, in addition to you know, reading books on the subject and the normal research you expect, that there's a lot of uh, communication with artists. Thank you. And Anne thanks you as well. Uh, so from Dan Curley, we have this question. What do we make of the fact that Seattle has been a multi-native cultural center for most of our history? Do not each of these groups deserve representation as well? Oh yeah, I think they do. And, uh, uh, and they have representation. Uh, the problem is, is that there was just too much representation of one group. Um, and I think that's, that's why it's good that we do have in, in the contemporary collections, we do have representations by other tribal groups. The difficulty is that it is a multicultural uh, city, but it was one culture of the Northwest Coast tribes that was represented in symbolic. So a follow-up question from Anne, and I, at this point, I invite anybody to feel free to turn on their cameras and ask their question directly. Uh, but what was the most surprising thing you learned, Anne asked, and what do white people need to know? <clears throat> Gosh. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> the most surprising thing. I've been studying this for so long, I can't really remember what surprises I've uh, I've learned. We'll have to think about that. I guess. I guess one thing that it was. It wasn't. I guess it was a surprise. I. I knew. Uh, I met and was around Dwayne Pasco for a while, uh, and I didn't know there was this controversy of the white guys uh, creating the art and and a lot of natives thinking that uh, they really shouldn't have been given much credit. I, I should say that's a lot of younger natives. Again, uh, the people who were contemporaries of Holm and Pasco, um, you know, I had great respect for them. But I was surprised there was the negative feeling. I understand it, but I was surprised to learn of it. Let's see, what was the other part of the question? What do you think white people need to know? That's a pretty well, broad question. Anne. Yeah, that's pretty broad. <laughs> I think white people just need to need to read up on on uh, native cultures since it's uh, so important around here. Um, and there's so many sources now that uh, it's, it's, you know, one should pay attention and read up on the subject. Is there anything in particular you recommend besides your own book to look, become more informed? Oh, oh gosh, I wish I had. Um, there's a one of the books I used as a source, I, I don't have it in my notes here. The UW Press published uh, a, a book in the last couple of years um, about uh, native symbolism, and I can't remember who wrote it. And there's also a book uh, that was actually written, not published locally, but it was about, and it was written, I think, by an author in Kansas, and it was about the uh, the entire program up in Alaska in the 1940s, it was part of the Depression era programs, late 30s, 40s, of uh, uh, refurbishing poles. And it got into a lot of interesting cultural uh, stories and issues. And, and I, some of the quotes I had in here uh, came from that book. Uh, would this maybe be it? Uh, Understanding Northwest Coast Art by Cheryl Shearer? No. Okay. All right. I'll keep um, looking. In the meantime, Steve has yeah. a question. Okay. I'll turn it over to him. Jim, and I apologize if you mentioned it, but I, what do you know about, there were three totem poles installed at a park near Kalama, and I think they're down near. And I remember one years ago being told it was the tallest uh, pole carved from a single tree or something like that. Was this Richard White's place, the place that was kind of a little meeting center? 
Well, it was, I, I actually saw it from the train. So it was over right along the Columbia River. Oh. And there were huh. three poles, one very tall. And I wish I knew the name of the park, but it was by a mm. marina in Columbia. Does anyone else, does that ring a bell with anybody else? Yeah. yeah. The, I would have to think about it a little bit, but the park uh, is where the, um, like I said, the, where the new McMenamin's development is also there along the river. Oh. Hmm. And there has been, there are some restored poles there. I, I guess I can't say for sure they're the ones you're talking about, but there's restored poles there and some explanatory plaques and some very good food to eat at McMenamin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fun place to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I know one, at least one of them was taken down for safety reasons a few years ago is what somebody yeah, told me. I, think that's um, I don't know. I, I just was curious. Um, you know, kind of what the origin of them were. Yeah, I don't know those. I think there's some information with them now, but um, I'm speaking from from memory here. Okay, I'll see. I'll see if I can find some more information. And uh, Jim, I may send that to you. Just that's to, great. Uh, Please thoughts. do. And then, uh, Jim, in the chat here, there's a, a comment from Sarah, uh, again, thanking you for your presentation, but also uh, a noting that the city of Kenmore has commissioned Tulalip artist Ty Juvenile, and I hope I said that kind of right, uh, to carve a story pole for the town square. Oh, really? Oh, good. I missed out on that one. So, <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. You might want to, do you want to add more information about that? Please do if you'd like to. Um, not really, other than what I wrote in there, um, I will say one of the easiest ways to um, bridge communication gaps is through the artists. So I'm with the, I run the Arts of Kenmore, and the uh, city of Kenmore had been really trying to build a relationship with the Tulalip. We are at a confluence of so many uh, tribal lands right here mm -hmm. up in Kenmore at the north end of Lake Washington. <laughs> So it's very touchy, um, but I've known the uh, a couple of the Tulalip artists for years, just because we're all artists and we hang out together. Um, so I connected uh, our our Kenmore Heritage Society with the artists, and then uh, Suzanne Greathouse was able to um, through Ty meet who she needed to meet with. And then also connected with the uh, everyone down at the Burke, um, as well as um, Isaac Sucha, who is a professor at UW. Um, but yeah, it's it's taken years, but really making the right um, leeway and bridging those communication gaps. My background is public art back in Minnesota. Ah. Um, we have a very different uh, cultural understanding back there. And I'm from up north. I grew up on uh, White Earth Reservation. Um, so maybe I just knew a little bit. Hmm. I'm just, I'm so impressed with everything that is happening out here in the Pacific Northwest. Really, um, yeah, from that very first totem pole. Hmm. Where we're at today, um, we're making headway, we're helping. Mm -hmm. And I think this was just a fantastic presentation. Boy, I'm really talking a little bit too much. <laughs> no, not at all. It was a fantastic presentation, very important. Um, I've actually attended a couple of your uh, presentations before, I'd like to say lectures, um, pre-COVID. Um, yeah, but it's really important uh, mm -hmm. that in the public art realm, we understand um, how to nurture these um, communications. So, yeah, Jim, if you know um, Jack Becker with public uh, with uh, Forecast Public Artworks mm. in Minneapolis, that's where my background is. Oh, okay. In fact, oh, yeah, next week they have a great lecture on this same from the artists. Hey, by the way, if uh, 
and, and Steve, you said you were going to send me something. Uh, my email address is jimmroop at comcast.net. No dots, just jimmroop at comcast.net. And if anybody else wants to send me anything, go ahead. Yep. I, could you put it in the chat? I might, because, you know, if I try to write that down, I think I'm going <laughs> to oh, okay. get it wrong. Or, or Lisa, <laughs> could you maybe... There we go. Lisa just, oh, Lisa just Thank typed you, it Lisa. in. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Any other questions? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, the uh, work on the uh, CCC poll project, uh, replacing the polls in Alaska under uh, the Roosevelt administration, uh -huh. that sounds an awful lot like the work of uh, Dr. Emily Moore at the University of Colorado. Uh, I'm the president of Friends of Native Art, or FONA, and we had her give a talk yeah. sponsored by us and the Berkeley Museum. Do you remember the title of her book? I don't. Yeah. Um, I will see if I can find it and um, uh, try to pass that along. Yeah. But she's she's from Ketchikan. Yep. And um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, she's now at Good the book. University of Colorado. Yeah. Is it Art of the Pacific Coast? That's the title that uh, uh, Carla suggested. Now, wait just, wait just a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, well, we do that. Short, wait just a minute, I think I have it here. All right, well, while Jim's checking his bookshelf, does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Uh, I, Dan Curley pointed out that there is a major Duwamish installation expected uh, when the renovated Coleman Dock reopens. I couldn't find I, I, it. But, but uh, was that, that was Dan's comment? Yeah. Dan, what, what piece are you referring to? I don't know that it's fully uh, designed even, hmm. but, but they're, they're rebuilding that uh, ferry mm -hmm. uh, passenger area there. Yeah. I don't even know if I'm supposed to talk about it, but I don't think it's any big secret. Uh, significant space has been set aside mm. uh, for for a Duwamish exhibit. That I don't know if you uh, the the Muckle Teal one uh, involved a, a lot of different tribes. Yeah, <clears throat> but this one I think is supposed to be uh, designed and to represent mm. represent them. Okay, Anne. I'm really intrigued by the 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 younger um, generations' art that that looks so modern, and I'm wondering what materials they're using and if they have the same. Um, they they have that same ethos of building public art, building art that stands in nature that is allowed to deteriorate um, when they're when the work is commissioned like for a pub, you know, for a public square or something. Oh. I'm thinking of mainly of like the Tacoma art, which I think is is so um, it's so like many other modern art um, interpretations that it doesn't necessarily scream Pacific Northwest Native Coast mm -hmm. art. Um, and then I wonder what the materials are and if they're adhering to um, the use of natural materials and well, things like it depends. That. It depends on the artist. I mean, there are a fair number of artists who are still working in wood and natural materials. Uh, there are an awful lot who are just uh, contemporary artists and, and use a wide range of materials. Uh, I don't, th I've never heard of a modern work uh, that would be made to deteriorate as a, as a traditional native work did. Uh, and I don't think any, anybody would commission such a thing. Uh, just as an aside, the only thing I know of, of anything that's been made in the last you know, many decades that the idea was that it would deteriorate is uh, not a native work, but John Grady's big tree in the lobby of the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, his goal is that eventually that will be taken apart and taken back up into the Cascades and based at the 
to put around the base of the tree from whence it came uh, and just is allowed to rot away. But I, I hope that that won't happen, but that's his goal. Well, in certain the name of Emily. And his use of glass is certainly not a traditional material. Who, who is that? Preston Singletary. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and, and Marvin Oliver did a lot in glass mm -hmm. and bronze. Robert had uh, something. Yeah, I, I, I found the name of Emily Moore's book. It's Proud Raven, Panting yes. Wolf, Carving Alaska's Do Deal Totem Parks. Yep. That's the one. And it, so the first part of it is Proud Raven... Panting wolf. Proud raven panting wolf. Yes. Can I make one comment on the deteriorating art? Sure. Uh, I, I do happen to have uh, a fairly modern, meaning within the last 10 years, copper bracelet that's, uh, that's made with Salish uh, carvings on it, not northern uh, northwest coast carvings. But the artist specifically specified that it is uh, it is meant to gather its own sort of uh, copper patina uh, with age, which in itself is kind of interesting because my understanding is that when the first European explorers arrived on the coast, they found that the little amount of copper uh, that was being used for jewelry and so forth was actually somehow polished. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's kind of interesting, but, but, and I don't even know if this artist was sort of aware of that, but at any rate, uh, he specifically wanted it to quote unquote, I guess, deteriorate in that way of, of lo mm. losing its polish and, and getting a, a patina or, or some, some uh. rust or something. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Jim, have you been able to, to present to any tribes? No, I, uh, this is only the second time uh, I've presented this and haven't really marketed it. Oh, it's exciting to think about. Let us know if you do, because we'd okay. love to hear about your experience. So uh, just as we close, I want to just encourage everybody to either check our website or uh, watch your email for our summer walks as the details get finalized there. And uh, we will be back in September with Jim at the helm with a brand new selection of programs for all of you to enjoy and learn from, like as we did from tonight's program. And Jim, I'll let you close us out. No, okay, as, as the new president, <laughs> I, I wish you well, and we'll see you all in the fall with a whole bunch of interesting presentations. So have a good summer and join us for some walks. Thank you. Good night.